All right. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Clyde C. Passat. I'm the head of training and certification for the Linux Foundation. Uh, and uh, this is really exciting to be our second open GovCon. We had one last year. It was our initial event. Uh, much nicer turnout this year, so I appreciate everyone coming. Uh, I actually started my career in the public service. I was with the Ministry of Finance in Trinidad and Tobago for several years um, early on. So it's got a close place in my heart trying to figure out now that I'm in the tech space how we bring the advantages of collaborative development that we see in the open source community to bear on the world sort of outside of tech. And uh, the world doesn't get any more real than when you're in uh, government uh, entities of one kind or another. So appreciate everyone joining. Uh, it is my pleasure this morning to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Major General Patrick Robeson, who is currently the Com Deputy Commanding General of the United States Special Arms Command at Fort Liberty. Uh, he has had a distinguished military career, uh, various leadership roles within special forces. Uh, that includes uh, commanding the 3rd Special Forces Group Airborne and serving as Chief of Staff for the United States Army Special Operations Command. Uh, I've been on Fort Liberty where uh, General Roperson has served as the commander of the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare uh, Center and School where he has been instrumental in shaping the uh, uh, special operations forces through their training and education programs. Uh, he has had extensive experience, uh, including operations enduring freedom, Iraqi freedom, and inherent resolve. Uh, he is married with three adult sons and a two-year-old uh, grandson. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Major General Prentice. Thanks. Thanks, Clyde. I appreciate that. Okay, I think everybody can uh, hear me. I will uh, just start off by saying, why, why am I here? I, I'm here because you know, I represent the United States Army, the Special Operations Command, um, and to a degree I represent the entire United States military, and our interest in, in technology, particularly you know, this open source technology, which we like because we can vet it. It's very uh, good for us, and we've used it extensively, so thanks for everything that's going on in the open source world uh, for us. So uh, who am I? Clyde went over that pretty quickly. I've got a lot of great experience with our special operations soldiers in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, all over the world. It's been my honor to serve you know, our country, and we've got to do a lot of great things together. So let's talk a little bit about uh, just you know, who, who the special operations community you know, is. For the Army, obviously it's special forces, which I represent. It's a uh, Ranger Regiment, you know, kind of our commando force. We have a uh, aviation regiment called the 160th, which has all of our special operations um, aviation capability, which is a little different than uh, your regular conventional force. Uh, we've got a civil affairs, you know, organization, a little smaller, that does a lot of the transitional governance piece. And we've got a psychological operations uh, regiment that works influence, basically. If you think about how do you, how do you get the, the word out about what you're doing, that's what our psychological operations folks uh, do. So one of the reasons that I'm here is because we're a little different than a lot of the other branches of the military. We are specially selected. Uh, every, every one of the people in our formation goes through some type of a selection to get here. We're a little smaller. We're more nimble. We probably make about fewer, a little bit less than 5% of the, uh, the military. And if you're small in that way, you can do things a little different. We've got a few special authorities that allow us to, you know, by technology, by equipment, a little differently than the way that the military does it. Um, and we're able to turn things, rapidly prototype things a little quicker than most others. I'd say that we're, we also have a philosophy of being in contact with the rest of the world, adversaries, whatnot. Um, we're watching what's happening in the Ukraine, obviously, closely. We're in CENTCOM with the, uh, what's going on in Iran. These, these things are very, very interesting to us. So we're always thinking about, hey, what are we doing in this world of technology? How is it helping us? How are we protecting ourselves? And how are we able to use this uh, against our adversaries in the event that we would need to? So that's kind of who we are. Um, I think one of the things that we've had to think about over the last few years is we, we have spent literally 25 years as a formation fighting you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And you don't spend 25 years doing something without, when it's over, having to think about, like, where am I at? What did I learn? 
what did I think about? What are the things that I, that I did really well? What are the things that I have to change in the future? And I think part of what we see is the world is changing. Obviously, the people that we had fought against in the Middle East, very, very, you know, savvy folks, but not as technologically savvy as some of the adversaries that we face, you know, today. If you think about Russia um, or the PRC, and these are competitors out there, I think that we have to look at that and say, well, if we ever had to deal with uh, people with this kind of uh, technology, what would we need and how would we have to protect ourselves and, and face them down? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that we've said, hey, what we did in the last 25 years, very good. You know, we, we did a lot, we learned a lot. What, how do we have to change to get into the future? And I think one of the things that we look at very carefully is how the battlefield has changed. And a lot of the, the, the wars that you see right now, they help us out and seeing that, particularly I think the Ukraine is a great example of how you know, we would have to fight in the future. And I think there's a couple things that we think about that are integral to what we're doing you know, and thinking about, hey, how is the battlefield changing? What if, what if we had to fight a large scale, we'd call it in the Army, a large scale ground combat you know, operation? You know, think large armies fighting each other. So we were thinking about, hey, how do we as in soft fit in, how do we complement the rest of our military uh, in the regard? What, what are our strong suits in a war like that? Uh, and how do we you know, capitalize on those things? Um, tech is one of those, as a matter of fact. Um, but one of the things that we see, it's a little different than the way that we fought in the last 20 years, the battlefield, things are very easy to sense, right? With an adversary that's very technologically sophisticated, anything that you have that, he, that emits, that adversary can see it, right? He can see it, I mean, this is one of the things that we noticed about Russia. They were fighting in a construct that was centralized command posts, centralized command posts, although you can't see them in the visual sphere maybe, but you can see them very easily in the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, with the advent of drone technology, you can put anything on a drone to be able to sense in a way. These are things that we, I think they learned rather quickly. We might have already known these things. That it's a very dispersed battlefield because if you can see it, you know, the other thing that we, we have done very well and that our adversaries do very well is sense. I think we just talked about that. But if you can sense it, the idea is also how can you shoot it, right? How can you destroy that? And if you can sense it, then technically you should assume somehow I can destroy it. Um, and that's what our, the Ukrainians have done very well as we're watching. They can sense it in a variety of different ways, uh, and they can shoot it. And that's, the, that's one of the ideas, I think, of the modern battlefield. If you think about what that does, that does a lot of different things. It's given a lot of, uh, I think, mm, the idea of dispersed battlefield, the empty battlefield, where if, you're, if everything is easy, easily sensed, whether through visual means or the electromagnetic spectrum, it drives an empty battlefield perspective. It forces you to not congregate, and it also forces you to fight in cities, right, as you see in whether it's Mosul or Gaza or all, Adivka, all these other places. If you're out in the open, it's a very dangerous place to be, right, because you can be sensed. All these precision munitions can uh, take their toll on you. And if you can't get to a city and fight, then you have to dig in, right, and you see all these trench works, all this kind of business. So it drives people underground. It drives them into buildings, into cities, all these uh, different kinds of ways. And this is definitely a manifestation of, uh, of modern war uh, that we're thinking about very carefully and looking at it all, in all different kinds of ways. So I think that uh, one of the things that we look at this is how do we protect ourselves in an environment like that? How do we protect our vulnerabilities and how do we capitalize on the, the vulnerabilities of our adversary? So that's just a little intro. And on this page, I'm just gonna go over a few of our tenants that we're looking at because again, I think we would, we would innovate no matter what in uh, US Army Special Operations, but uh, the watchword of the day in our military is innovation as well. And it's one of the things that we are doing on behalf of the Army is leading the way in a lot of these innovative areas. That first bullet, it talks about irregular warfare. Irregular warfare is actually one of the tenants that we do in Army Special Operations and I'll just I make it rather simple. For us, the majority of irregular warfare is working with a partner, any type of a, of a partner. Um, if you think about what we did in Iraq, you know, we worked with a partner called the Iraqi Counter-Terrorist Service. You know, we had Afghan commando partners, 
in, uh, in Afghanistan. Any type of host nation partner, could be military, it could be a militia group of some type, um, that is generally how we look at irregular warfare. Um, and we, can, we leverage that throughout space and time in the sense of like, there's a, a deep battlefield area that we can leverage partners, there's a close battlefield area, there's a rear battlefield area that we can leverage these partners of some type. If you think about a combat multiplier, it's not just us you know, on the battlefield, it's some type of partner um, that we're using a network of partners to operate with. Uh, and I think that's what you, when you think about irregular warfare, that's what we do. And there's a certain technological challenge that comes with that also because we're not always in the same place with these partners. These aren't gigantic armies that are together, shoulder to shoulder on a battlefield. This is a very dispersed network of people trying to communicate, and obviously technology is the thing that helps us keep that network of people together and on track. And protecting that network is one of the things that we're doing uh, quite often. That next one I kind of talked about already, the idea of closing a sensor to shooter loop and this is the entire military's issue as well, if you think about it. If you could see targets all over the battlefield, which I'm sure that in World War II they could, they could do, the question would be, how do you actually shoot those targets? And then you have to say, if I can sense it and I could shoot it, how quickly can I sense it and shoot it? And then I think you have to say, okay, if I can rapidly sense and shoot it, uh, how does my adversary you know, get inside of that loop and block it uh, and deny me the ability to, to be able to do that. So all of those problems when it comes to sensing and shooting, these are things that we think about. For us, it's a bit of a more of a, a problem in the sense of like, if you have a human network that's operating in a denied area or a deep area and they're sensing things, how do you use technology to enable that group to, uh, to partner? In that upper right, uh, corner, you see the idea of resistance. Resistance is really a form of regular warfare. Usually, resistance is about the idea of a, a group that's operating in the deep space. Obviously, every a fifth column, whatever you want to call it. Uh, think about the French resistance in World War II. That French resistance is doing a lot of things like providing us intelligence before D-Day, all these kinds of things. We operate in the same construct today, just in a more technologically I think savvy way, and the same thing with our adversaries who are trying to stop these resistance networks from operating. That next bullet on the left, information advantage. Think about it like this. Uh, you're trying to protect the information that you've got. That's one way of thinking about it. Protect and be able to communicate, you know. So you're trying to protect your systems. You're trying to deny your adversary the ability to see how you're communicating. That's one way of thinking about it, which is the way that we strongly think about it all the time. But the other way of thinking about information advantage would be, how do you portray yourself uh, in the world, and how are you able to counter people that use malign information against you? And I don't think anybody in this audience is unaware of the fact that we have individuals in this world that are very quick to spin, to do all kinds of different things to deny the truth about your intentions and what you're doing. Uh, we're always thinking about, hey, how do I get the story out that's correct? And in some ways, if we have to, we can actually uh, do deception because war is like any other game where you're trying to actually deceive an adversary as to this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to attack here. No, actually, I'm going to attack here. So the idea of using information to be able to do that, I think, in a tactical or strategic manner is, is important as well. So global access, the other piece up there, is it really about Army Special Operations' ability to be all over the world. And usually we operate in small teams, which I uh, have to highlight. That's one of the characteristics that we're selecting people for. Can you operate as part of a small element, you know, in a discontiguous kind of a, a manner? And can you go to other places, operate with a, some type of indigenous partner force, uh, training, whatnot, uh, and have and gain access for us to these other different countries and parts of the world. That's one of the things that we're always operating on. And we want to gain access to other places and build partners uh, and allies. Okay, so I already hit on resistance. I think that that piece on drones, I think everybody in here is pretty aware of drones. The idea of drones is pretty interesting. I actually 
got to fight in 2003 in Iraq, we did not have any drones. And uh, the idea of drone pr proliferation and what drones have become, I got to go back to Iraq and Afghanistan about every six to eight months after that. And uh, seeing the evolution of drones and how drones worked, I thought was it's an amazing thing to look back on and think about because that, that technology proliferated extremely quickly. And then what you could put on a drone, you know, with different pods, different weapon systems, different full motion video, whatever you'd like, whatever you can imagine, you can put on a drone. And for a long time, we had a monopoly on drone technology, really. Um, and then suddenly, there was a gigantic proliferation. Obviously, Iran makes uh, drones. Turkey makes drones. Pretty much every country in the world makes drones. Um, the PRC makes some very high-tech drones that are very good. Uh, so the proliferation of this technology, both in our ability to use drones and I think our ability to counter drones, that's a big, that's a big deal. It's not, it's not lost in us that every adversary that we're up against has some type of a drone capability, and usually that drone capability goes as far as a kinetic capability as well. Whether, he's, whether that adversary is using that drone to guide in ammunition, garner intelligence, or that drone is actually some type of a, uh, a loitering munition or a one-way attack drone. We, we see all different types. And I think that this is just going to be part of uh, our life for a long time to come. So how are we thinking about using that to our advantage? And how are we thinking about um, countering the enemy's ability to use it against us? Um, triad, if you think about, uh, this, is, this is one of my uh, commander, Lieutenant General Braga, one of his initiatives, which I think is uh, phenomenal, the idea that we, operating in small teams, as in SOF, can leverage the power of both space and cyber technology. I would also say there's a signals piece to that, but you can only use three in a triad. So talking about space in the sense of, you know, I think a lot of us took for granted uh, that, you know, satellites are an extremely important, you know, aspect from a technological perspective of how we operate. For a lot of us, that's somewhat transparent. But if you're using GPS, if you're communicating, you know, if you're uh, obviously even the idea of like sensing and seeing, you know, you can do all kinds of different things. You know, I think everybody's read in the, the uh, open source about the Ukrainians and their ability to use Starlink, all these other types of things, low Earth orbiting satellites. I think that the uh, this is just the beginning on satellite technology, uh, and it's going to be, I, I would say, quite revolutionary uh, as we go forward in the future. There's also something to it about an inability of an enemy to deny a, a nation the, the use of those satellites, like with Starlink. And I think that countries see that, hey, it's our, uh, it should be one of the main pillars of our resistance uh, uh, format to have that ability to communicate, to not be denied the ability to communicate. I think if, if Russia would have denied the Ukraine's ability to communicate, like if they'd have been able to shut down Zelensky's speech, that would have uh, made their fight a lot easier. But they weren't able to do that for a variety of reasons. So that's kind of the triad piece. Um, strike, we kind of talked about that. But I think if you think about it, there's been a revolution in precision munitions. That's really, I think, happened since uh, the Gulf War. We got to put our you know, wares on display there. But I think it's only gotten better. A lot of these munitions actually can go farther. They're much more accurate. Uh, and I think the power of a small team, you know, that can actually leverage the power of a loitering munition, very powerful. That, that works for us, but it also can work for our adversary, you know, as well uh, in that sense. And we are working diligently, you know, testing all types of those uh, munitions and one-way attack drones as well. Because I think the evolution of warfare used to be one guy next to another guy with a spear or a sword, and that was your power. I think the evolution of gunpowder, the rifle, all these things has made one person or one small team much more powerful. The idea in our minds about strike is we want to make small teams very, very lethal and very powerful. And I think that is not going to stop, and that's what we we're working on doing. Influence, we kind of spoke about this with information advantage. The idea of, hey, getting your message out, denying the adversary, you know, his, his message. I think there's also a, 
another way of trying to make sure that you're influencing your partners. Hey, this is why we fight. This is what we're doing. This is all of the things that are important to us. Uh, so that is very near and dear to our heart. That is part of our SIOP um, portfolio. On the connect piece, obviously there are people that are trying to deny us the ability to connect uh, and deny us the ability to communicate with partners, with ourselves, that is just part of warfare. So we're always thinking, how do I secure my communications? How do I make sure that everything that I want to do, we can communicate? Because the minute that you can cut somebody's communications, you know, they're basically a ship adrift on the ocean in warfare. So connecting and being connected. How do I hide my signal from the adversary? All of these things, extremely important to us. Uh, the integration part kind of goes with the connecting piece. If we have in the military, tons of different groups and organizations of people. You got the Air Force, you got the Navy, you get different subsets of the Air Force, Navy, Army. How are we all able to see the same information? How are we able to see it in a rapid and quick manner? We, all, we talk about a single pane of glass where, hey, we can see this UAS. We know how much fuel it has. We know what it's armed with. One, one person or every person can know that, that needs to know that. Hey, what do I strike with? Can I strike that? Who's there? Who's not there? Blue force, red force, all of those different things. How are we able to share that common operating picture? So we are always thinking about uh, how to integrate that. Um, and then we already talked about sensing. OK. And I'm going to hit, this is just our, my last slide, and then I'll go on to questions. I was going to hit a couple things on here that I want to talk about. We talked about specially selected people. You know, our first soft truth is that humans are more important than hardware. And I think when we camp with that, we thought about hardware as like vehicles and guns. But I would say we now think about it like hardware and software. So we think humans are more important, obviously, than those things. But we do give our humans the best training and the best equipment, including the best hardware and software that we can possibly you know, come up with, uh, with our authorities, with testing, in partnership with industry. Obviously, one of the reasons I'm talking is because I want industry to know what we're thinking about and what we need out there. And along that line of humans being more important than hardware, I'm going to go to that human performance and wellness because technology is not really just about, hey, uh, how do I protect myself and how do I look for vulnerabilities in my adversary? Technology is also something on the human side that we're looking at deeply to say, how do I enhance the performance of the, uh, the humans that I work with, my soldiers, right? If you think about the idea of wearables, you know, and the idea of being able to track, whether it's your sleep, your physical performance, your exercise characteristics, we wanna make sure that the, the humans that we employ are operating at their optimum level, both physically and mentally. This is something that we've been looking at extensively. I think we're getting a lot better. Obviously, I came into the military in 1985, we did not have anything like this. And now uh, I think I'm old, but I look at that and I'm like, this is a great, great thing to do. We've had a lot of evolutions in how do we take care of people. I think the idea of integrating tech with, the, with data on that front has been a, a game changer for us. Um, I think we already went over the modernization priorities. We have a, also a big program that goes into uh, women women in RSOF and how we're handling women, I think that's been something that's been a bit of a, uh, it's been a good news story. We probably, I'd say 16% of our force is female in, in RSOF. I think it's a little greater in the Army, but we want to make sure that we're handling that as well, whether it's does body armor fit the same way. Uh, we're talking about optimizing performance. Turns out men and women are different, so we're always thinking about those things in a different kind of a way. So. We're working pretty diligently on that. I think I hit most of the other stuff. I'm going to wrap it up right there. I'm going to stop for Q&A, and I'll take any questions anybody has on uh, any topics that I've covered. Over to you. Sir. Yes, I think that the Army does, and I think that you know Army SOF does as well, where we, we actually invite the joint community, I think, to do these hacking uh, contests with them, because I think we're trying to figure out 
right now I think we're in the stage of saying, how good are we? Like if we went to one of the, a university on the East Coast and participated in one of their hacking events, um, how good are we compared to other people and what they have to offer? So anytime something like that's available, we will send some of our, our teams out there. We're always, we're looking for people that have that skill set. And part of it is we're trying to bring folks in that have that skill set. Part of that is we will retrain people to develop that skill set because we get some very highly qualified folks. And then, yeah, through competition, through testing, we are uh, trying to develop that uh, side of ourselves very well. That's a big part of our competition strategy. Sure. So one of the most interesting things about the Hack the Machine program was that the Navy brought in uh, a bunch of hardware and software. Um, so that was more what I was uh, thinking of just in terms of uh, if, you know, Softcom brought in hardware and said, take a go. Yeah, I think what we're doing is we're actually setting up facilities where we can bring in the hardware and, uh, you know, hack, hack into the hardware. Things that replicate other things around the world is what we're trying to, to go for here. Uh, things that you would see in the environment and how do you hack into those? How do you protect your own equipment from that? Uh, particularly your digital footprint, all these different kinds of things. So we're working pretty diligently on that. So yeah, I think we're, we're hitting it. Okay, sir. correlation with what RSOF does too, right? Building communities, using indigenous forces to, you know, um, for, the, for the will of what, what we, for national security, right? As we move into a digital warfare age, right? Yeah. I think those communities are changing. What is uh, RSOF's um, view on leveraging open source community and building those communities? So like what we saw with the XE attack where those communities can be used for bad, right? How can we yeah. leverage um, these communities for good? Yeah, I think one of the things, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, uh, the Ukraine example, because I think what we have that we've been able to leverage to a great degree on the open source side, and I think about, um, like we could say BDA, what, what's going on in you know, occupied territory um, at, a, at a variety of different levels. Like, and, and to us, if we open source you know, questions, uh, through the right networks, we get a lot of answers that we could not derive in other types of ways um, on what are the enemy activity, adversaries, infrastructure, all these different kinds of things. I think that is something that on the open source world, that's, that's one aspect of it. I think on the other side, just being able to look at, at the web if it has not been taken down in certain areas and seeing what's going on, what, what's the adversary doing in this open, open kind of a way. To, to me, it's another world that we did not have access to and could not leverage you know, really prior to this. So I think we're thinking about those things. We have, as a matter of fact, we operate really in a coalition with a lot of other nations, soft entities. And I would say working with them, they gave us a lot of ideas that we hadn't really been leveraging before on this uh, in the open source piece. And we're, we are always driving towards, we need to leverage open source more because it's, you know, there's a huge amount of information out there that we can, we can use to our advantage in a good way. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Sir, go ahead. Thank you, First General, for being here. Uh, yeah. Vision Lab, Team Orlando, those kind of guys. Okay. Uh, we've actually seen a lot of modernization with the way the Army works with procurement, with things like SIBRs and OTAs. Money flows faster. But then what we're finding is when we're using projects that use a lot of open source, we're trying to deliver to the government, and then we hit RMF and cyber, and it all falls apart. How do you see that, you know, that paradigm modernizing to where we can be agile and deliver a national security capability to the Army when the Army themselves are the ones saying they don't want it? I guess to not to talk too bad about the signals, guys. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's all right. I don't, well, I can't, I can't speak for those branches of the Army, although I, we do work with Cybercom to some degree. I think, here's what I would say. I think the military has been in a paradigm for most of its existence that is not about open source. We've been in a paradigm that's very much about like, 
I keep secrets, and it's my right to keep secrets, and I don't want to tell you anything about what's going on, and I don't want, you don't even need to help me because I'll figure this out myself. I think we're, we're trying to change that slowly, you know, but surely uh, we are changing that. And again, I think, and this is what I've seen over 20 years of war, if you want to be effective uh, on a battlefield, you, as in the military, aren't going to think of all these great ideas yourself. I can't imagine a time in history when it's not more apparent that industry and technology are an integral part of what we're doing. And if you buy a piece of equipment that you can't update with software immediately, if you don't have a, either an open source way of doing that with uh, you know, computer, uh, software engineers, or you don't have a field service rep that does the proprietary work, you are going to get your lunch eaten on a battlefield because the enemy will. And one of the things that we see with other countries is their bureaucracy, part of its desperation, but I'm sure their bureaucracy is less because the stakes are a lot higher and they're able to turn their innovation part in tech a lot quicker because, again, when you're fighting for your life, you're willing to try things, rapidly prototype, uh, and get things out a lot faster. I think for us, I think we're going that way more. I think the idea of Army Futures Command, you know, being in Austin, kind of opening things up a little bit, I think things are happening a bit more on the, on incrementally than you'd see if you were in contact with an adversary where you're having to like rapidly change, where the enemy's like punch, counter punch. Uh, however, we are watching very carefully and I think we want to emulate some of that things. And I, um, I think that's one of, the, one of our competitive advantages in soft, we're able to do that a little bit quicker, uh, but not as quickly as I think that we would like. We want to be more involved in innovation and testing and seeing what's going on out there. Uh, so I don't know if I have a great answer for you, but I know how, particularly on the cyber side, they're like, you know, their, their mission that they're told is protect the network. And if they think about protecting the network, that means I don't let anybody in, <coughs> not even my friends. Uh, so, but I'm sure they're working on it. I know, I, know, I know to get better, you have to be, you have to open up to a certain degree. And that how much you open up is uh, to others, yet yeah, you have to, I'll leave that to their commander to, to decide. Thank you, great question. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Thank you, General, that was an amazing talk. Um, uh, if you were a major general, I don't know if Russians have major generals or the PRC have major generals. I don't know. They've but, got uh, some crazy ranks. If, for sure. uh, if you were the yeah. uh, if you were the counterpart in uh, you know one of our competitors, like you put it, which I thought yeah. was interesting, um, how would the slide deck look different? Uh, I think I think one of our advantages is that we live in a country that is, I think, a the paradigm of a meritocracy, where I think the folks that we're getting uh, in our military out there because they're highly qualified. We can leverage industry. We live in a country where we have some of the greatest tech industry in the world. And I think we've been able to like change and look back at that and leverage. I think one of our strengths is that we're able to look back and say, you know, uh, we could have done that better. We should have changed this. We don't, ha we don't have a paradigm like, I've been all over the world. I've I spent six years in, in combat in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've seen some other militaries and how they do things, and I think ours is much more agile. I think that a, a lot of uh, what I see with our adversaries is they're not quite, uh, in my opinion, as agile. They had a lot of old, older paradigms. Now, that's not to say that they didn't do some things I thought very well, but they have older ideas, in my opinion, about how to fight, and the ideas of like maybe underestimating their adversary. I think. I think a lot of times what we're very good at is like uh, taking in a lot of feedback and saying, okay, if that's what the real truth is, okay, then now I'm going to have to adjust. And I think that if you live in a, uh, some of these other places, we could say, I want to tell the boss what he wants to hear. And then you don't exactly get the truth. We're like, we're capable of this and they're going to love us if we just come in there. And I think, I think for us, we're able to say, no, actually, I'm in a constant state of change and self-improvement. And I'm, I'm not sure that uh, other militaries are quite as good about doing that. that, and that that's what I think, like, I, I don't give speeches and say, hey, I'm capable of anything all the time. I, I give talks and say, this is where I need to improve on. 
I think if you can give a talk and say, this is where I need to improve on, that's a very different place than saying I'm capable of anything. But I think that's, to me, that is the difference. Uh, there are a few other ones, but those are the big ones. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting being on the other side. I used to be in the Army, and so it's pretty cool seeing this kind of talk. Um, after I got out of the military, I got into venture capital. We're probably one of the only VC funds here in the PNW that do defense tech, gov tech investing. Uh, part of that is, you know, in talks with DOD and the innovation and modernization unit that they have. Last year, they spent $80 million on startups, different kinds of tech to integrate into, you know, the Army, the Air Force, the Marines. Um, I'll be presenting to them next month on stuff we can do better. So, you know, based off of your answer to his question, what do you think can we do better? On the industry side? Mm -hmm. uh, I think things like this are a great help to understand, hey, what is our, you know, what's going on in the world? What's the, what's the evolution of warfare? What are the things that I think that the, the military would be interested in? What do I think that they need? I think there's that. There's what's the demand signal out there for the, the things that I am producing. But then I also think, kind of like the, uh, the iPhone model, I have a, such a great idea that you have not even thought of. I will produce something that you didn't even know that you wanted, but it's so great you, you can't say no to this. Uh, the, the kind of technology that's, okay, game changer, hadn't thought about that. Uh, I mean, I'll just tell you, in the early 2000s, I didn't think that I thought drones were interesting. I can get a helicopter to do that, but I was wrong, so <laughs> totally wrong. And uh, my opinion on those kinds of things has changed significantly, but it, it took the, the tech side to figure out, like, hey, there's utility, you know, in this, uh, and you should be using these kinds of things. Because, obviously, the military can be conservative. I'm not sure it's as conservative as it used to be. The tech industry is not conservative at all. Uh, it's on the cutting edge. And I think the idea of like, hey, you should try this. You should, you should think about this. This is how you can apply this. I've seen the fighting over here. You should, look, you should check this out. I think this would be a game changer for you. So to me, I think that's uh, one of the things. I'm not saying that the industry does that badly. I, I, think that, I think that we, probably in the military, have some places that we can improve on uh, bringing in tech and incorporating tech r more rapidly and quicker and how do we see that uh, happening. So I think there's give and take on both sides. Thanks. Go ahead. And I think we have time for one more question. Thank you so much for being here. OK. Um, here we go. Uh, is, it, is this the one? Just so I'm sure this is, this is the one. OK. So good morning, sir. So I'm a major in the, in the Air Force. I'm not special operations. OK. So you mentioned at the beginning of your talk special authorities, the ability to move quickly. Yeah. But there's the rest of us that are 95% yeah. of the rest of the force. And how do you conceptualize taking the quick learning that special operations does yeah. and propagate that out to the rest of the force? Yeah, and I think, again, when I look at us, I think because we have a few of these pieces that enable us to, to innovate quickly, I look at it as our responsibility to make sure that Anything that we learn, we are rapidly getting out to the rest of the formation. Uh, I think it would be a shame if we did not do that and we just kept that to ourselves. I think, you know, being insular about things is the enemy of progress. Uh, and I think that we have, we should if we, we, we have, but I think we can always do a better job of instilling everybody to make sure like, hey, we are, like we're the Army's Special Operations Force, AVSOC, you know, is the, the, the Air Force's piece. And everything that we have, we are very willing to share with the rest of our DOD formation. We're not a silo, you know. We are, uh, you know, inclusive, not exclusive. That's what we think about uh, doing those things. Because, and, and again, we, you know, have to think about, hey, what's our value proposition to the rest of the military, to the nation? And I think innovation and sharing that innovation with others is part you know, if you have these responsibilities, you know, great power, you got these responsibilities to share. So that's the way that we think about it. No one, no one in our business is in the business of hiding things. Maybe we used to be. And I think that we, during the war, 
This is one of the things that came out of the war that was pretty evident. We got to share, we got to tell other people what we're doing, whether it's an operation, whether it's a technology that we have. We have to share and be open about, hey, I've got this, you might want to try this. This is pretty good. Didn't think it was going to be great, turns out it's fantastic, you might want to try it. So that's, that's how I look at that. Right. You bet. Okay. Yep. Really appreciate everyone coming out to this session. Uh, 